What would a world without Pokémon be like? Well, there would be no warnings about staying too close to the TV during anime, there would be no Pokémon in Smash Brothers, and I wouldn't be reviewing Pokémon Blue right now. So while writing this review, the giant predicament I came up with is how does one review Pokémon? It's not like it's obscure and needs to be reviewed, I think it's a classic game. Everyone has played either the original games or the newer ones, and with all of the improvements in the newer games, the original games seem outright archaic. There's no actual reason to review it. So you're probably wondering, why review Pokémon? The answer is simple, because I can. So the history of Pokémon. You either probably don't care about it, or already know it, so here's the extreme Cliff Notes version. The first two versions, Red and Green, were released in 1996 in Japan, and as they say, the rest is history. The games Red and Blue didn't make it to North America until 1998. Blah blah blah, it prints money. My personal history with the franchise sort of goes like this. My introduction to this series started when I turned off my Sega Genesis and switched to YTV one fateful morning to see what was on. And it turned out to be the first episode of the anime. For perspective, I was in grade 5, I was 9 years old, turning 10 the following month. Long story short, I was hooked, and I got Pokémon Blue for my 10th birthday a month later from my grandparents. You have no idea how old that summary just made me feel. One of the many things that I just love about this game is the instruction booklet, or as they call it, the Pokémon Trainer's Guide, although age has caught up to mine. Unlike a lot of today's instruction manuals, it's in full color. I think the worst thing about it is a pre-release picture that's used twice. It's not so much the fact that it's used twice that bothers me, it's what it says. The Brock wants to fight. The book also has a mini walkthrough, getting you to Pewter City. Throughout the book, there's the official artwork, and at the end, there is a list of Pokémon. Personally, I also think that this list is rather clever. It acts like a Pokédex, showing you all of the Pokémon that were in the instruction manual. There is also a map, although it's incredibly crude. Even though it's rough, I like this map. It gets your imagination active. You wonder what type of cities or towns these places are like. They also have the type chart in the manual. Of course the type chart would actually have to mean something! Balance did not exist in the first generation games. Psychics were broken, half of the bug Pokémon had poison as secondary types, ghosts, despite having the ability to hurt psychics, were unable to due to a programming error, and the three ghost types also had poison as a secondary type, rendering them next to useless. Poison-type Pokémon were also incredibly common, and perhaps one of the biggest reasons why psychics were so powerful was because of what is now known as Special Attack and Special Defense was just one stat known as Special, and it ruled over all. And this part is just seriously too funny for me to not bring up. In a section describing rare Pokémon and how they only appear once, they have a picture of a Zubat right beside it. For comparison, I also felt like looking at the instruction manual for Pokémon White. And is it ever boring? Page after page of text, and if you're lucky, you might get a picture from the game. There is no official artwork or anything. The back of the box is just awesome. I really don't know how to describe it. Nowadays, boxes just seem to have bullet points that pretty much say, yeah, you've looked up everything on the internet. You know if you're gonna buy it before you even reach the store. Why do I even bother? Not to mention it's in pure English. There is no French or Spanish or any disclaimer text that takes up half of the box to make it crowded. Important! No single Pokémon can win it all! Unless of course you're playing Smash Brothers. Can you develop the ultimate Pokémon strategy to defeat the eight gym leaders and become the greatest Pokémon master of all time? Go Alakazam! Collect up to 139 different Pokémon playing the red version. This is the blue version. You'll need both versions, red and blue, to collect all of the Pokémon. One, this was already on the front cover, and the line directly above it. You don't need to be redundant. Two, where is the fine print saying except for the event Pokémon? And yes, one did exist back then. Save your Pokémon collection and the game's progress on the game memory pack. Oh, thank Arceus! I thought we were gonna have to use passwords! Requires basic reading skills to fully enjoy the entertaining story. And by entertaining story, we mean excuse plot. I think I'll let the trainer's guide handle this one. You are an 11-year-old boy living in Pallet Town with your mother. 
You also apparently like choose your own adventure books. It talks about your rival and how one day you go out in search of wild Pokemon, only to be stopped by Professor Oak and given a Pokemon. The plot has mostly stayed the same for each of the main games. A young trainer gets their first Pokemon, goes out into the world, collects eight gym badges, fights against the evil team to save the region, world, universe, existence of every single person alive, catch as many Pokemon as you can, and becomes the best Pokemon trainer in the region. And then there's the post-game content. As I said before, or it's just an excuse plot. It's just there to help you move through the game, and as some people would say, the only focus is the competitive side of the games. Unfortunately, I'm not a competitive player, so I can't really focus on that end. I do know about it, but I'm not exactly the best person to ask about it. The best I've done is just whip up some teams using Smogun as a guide to fight against my one cousin every time we see each other at family gatherings. Let's just start the game. I'm using the Game Boy Player, for the Nintendo GameCube. So in this playthrough I'll use my real name, Michael, and the rival's name will just be the most boring, blandest thing I could possibly think of. Guy. Yeah, I thought about abusing the naming feature, but everyone's done it before and the novelty has worn off. In the rare chance that I spontaneously combust and my gaming collection is sold for the $500 that it's worth, it's not really worth it. So the first blast of nostalgia I got was how stupid I was when I was a kid, and how it took me 5 minutes to figure out how to exit the house. I actually remember looking through the instruction manual trying to figure out how to exit the house. I was a dumbass when I was a kid. My first Pokemon was a Charmander, so I chose Charmander again to honor that day. And now we have the introduction of your rival, who is a giant jerk. He will always choose the Pokemon that has the type advantage to yours. Of course, if he went first, I would gladly do the same. After a battle, you're off on your own Pokemon journey, catching Pokemon, going to gyms, beating trainers, saving the world, and becoming the best Pokemon trainer around. The gameplay of capturing monsters and using them to battle wasn't new at the time. As far as I know, the first game to use this mechanic was Digital Devil Story Megami Tensei for the Famicom. You fight in turn-based battles. Each of your Pokemon can only know four moves, and you can only have six Pokemon on your team, adding elements of strategy. Pokemon also learn new attacks by leveling up. Why am I even saying this? You should know this already. For the rest of the video, I'm just going to assume you know how Pokemon is played, and I'm just going to state my observations. I found the AI to be painfully stupid, using moves such as Confuse Ray when my Pokemon was already confused, or not finishing off my Pokemon when it had the chance. At other times, it was actually rather smart, and was constantly making sure that my Pokemon had status effects. Throughout my playthrough, what surprised me the most is how much of the little things that have changed. Small little improvements that you don't notice at first, or have become commonplace that going against them is rather shocking. I was actually shocked that you had to manually change the boxes in the computer. Speaking of the boxes, they were only in text and stored only 20 Pokémon. I also had a few cruel reminders that Pokémon aren't healed when they go into boxes, like they are in the newer games. The lack of an experience bar also annoyed me. I was constantly wondering how much more experience a Pokémon needed to level up. The experience bar added convenience so you didn't have to go through several menus to find out. For wild Pokémon, the lack of a Pokéball icon saying that you've caught a species of Pokémon also stunned me, and it took a few seconds to remember if I had already caught certain Pokémon. The lack of abilities actually also shocked me a bit. I didn't have to worry about Pikachu's static or the Nidoran's line's poison pin. The fact that Magnemite wasn't a Seal's type screwed me up a bit, and my usual strategy of killing it with fire took a bit longer than normal. It's one thing to say Steel types were introduced in Generation 2, but after four generations of fire being a Magnemite's weakness, including in the remakes, it's really hard to not instinctively attack with fire. Another thing that screwed me up was that you had to go into the menu and select the HM move that you wanted to use instead of just pressing A while facing a small tree, a boulder, or a body of water. I'm actually rather surprised that my 10-year-old self had the patience to constantly go into menus and do this every minute. Although the newer games haven't just added stuff, they've also taken stuff away. There is at least one small thing that I miss in the newer generations, the ability to cut grass by using cut. It ultimately serves no purpose unless you want to avoid battles, in which case I don't know why you wouldn't just buy a repel, and it's rather tedious to use it to clear a root of all of its grass. But the first time I found out about it, I thought it was neat. Then again, I was also 10 years old. I had also forgotten how awesome some of the songs are, and once I'm done with this video I'll probably be downloading them and putting them on my iPod. I didn't find the encounter rate that bad, until I got to Mount Moon, where every other step seemed to trigger a battle. I just made sure for any future caves I was stocked up on repels. Most Pokémon trainers remain stationary and don't move to face you. 
it's actually rather easy to sneak around and avoid battles, unlike the recent games. The gyms also rarely have any puzzles for you to solve before fighting the gym leaders. The NPCs also say some rather weird things to start battles, such as, I like shorts, they're comfy and easy to wear. Clearly this was the entertaining story that was advertised on the back of the box. I actually found it amusing that in the Celadon City Gym, one of the trainers tells you not to use the Pokemon her types are weak against. Don't bring any bugs or fire in here! Fine, if you insist, go Alakazam! Also, the Pokemon fan club president is clearly a brony. Some of the most memorable NPCs are in Lavender Tower. The channelers are possessed and say some rather disturbing things, such as they want your blood or soul, or what my sister thinks is the best battle cry ever. ZOMBIES! And then there's the one kid outside. Do you believe in ghosts? No, of course not! That would just be stupid! <laughs> I guess not. That white hand on your shoulder is not real. Looking back at the Pokémon now, some of the designs are weird, such as Pikachu being fat. Bellsprout looks like it's possessed by the devil. Actually, I take that back. Executor is possessed by the devil. I mean, holy crap! Oh, that will be in my nightmares for the next few weeks. After obtaining the eight gym badges, you go and face the Elite Four. Would you actually believe that there was a time when someone waiting for you after the Elite Four was actually a plot twist? Compared to the newer games, the post-game content is relatively short. You just have one new area to go to, Unknown Dungeon, and you can capture Mewtwo there. And then there is the most memorable thing about the games. The glitches! Perhaps what is the most well-known glitch is the Missing Note glitch. It's probably pronounced Missing Number, but I've always said Missing No, and that's how everyone pronounced it at school. The reason why it's so well-known probably has to do with its side effects. By just encountering it, the sixth item in your bag is duplicated so many times that the game has to use tile sets to show you how many you have. Missing No is encountered by talking to the old man who gives you the game's tutorial on catching Pokémon and then flying to Cinnabar Island, where you can proceed to swim up and down the coast until you encounter it. Of course, now we all know it's actually just the game reading your name as wild Pokémon encounter data, since the game was programmed to store it there during the tutorial. Also, depending on your name, you might encounter other Pokémon. For more information than you could ever possibly want on Missing No, I suggest going to this website. Other famous glitches include Glitch City. Glitch City is accessed by tricking the game into thinking that you're still inside the Safari Zone after you've left. It's just a corrupted map that you were on previously, so the appearance of Glitch City is dependent on which route you were on. The Mew glitch was discovered in 2003, and it allowed you to capture a Mew and any other Pokémon you wanted. From what I've read, it works because you've started a battle but fled and did another battle. The special stat of Slowpoke is the same as the hexadecimal code for Mew, so upon returning to the route, the fight resumes, but it pulls the data from the previous Pokémon you defeated and creates a wild Pokémon. Jeez! Just imagine if this had been found out earlier! Any kid that knew about it would have been worshipped as Arceus. One glitch that I had to use to, to a lack of time, which was completely my fault to begin with, is a simple exploit that allows you to skip Marowak's ghost battle. You just use a Poké Doll to flee from battle, and Marowak moves on. By doing it this way, you avoid getting the Slyph scope and your first encounter with the boss of Team Rocket, Giovanni. However, the game doesn't account for this, so despite being the first time I met him while in Saffron City, he talks like we've met before. Clearly meaning that Giovanni is the protagonist's father. The glitches added so much to the game, it excited the imagination, making one wonder just what else was in the cartridge. What other unexplored areas were there? Missing No wasn't just a glitch. To kids, it was another Pokémon. Glitch City was like another world. Even translation errors and localization oversights added so much to the game. As a kid, you were wondering how did Raichu evolve when it was traded to an NPC in the game? Was there really a way to get Pika Blue, now actually known as Meryl? God, I was a dumbass when I was a kid. So, does Generation 1 still hold up? I'd say it's still fun. The game might not be perfect, and any element of strategy quickly becomes have a psychic type and some other Pokémon for the rare times where psychics aren't the most efficient choice or are knocked unconscious. And then once you get to Cinnabar Island, the game becomes completely broken. Every moment of this game has been a nostalgic punch to the face. The only way it could have been more nostalgic is if the Game Boy player had the borders from Pokémon Stadium. 
and it actually really saddens me that I couldn't play through the game legitimately. Instead, having to blast my way through in a few days to record all of the footage, using the Poke Doll trick to skip a portion of the game, and using Missing No to power level. Nowadays, unless you're looking for the humble beginnings of Pokémon, have nostalgia for these games, or want to try all the different glitches, it's not really worth it to play through. You can't transfer over your Pokémon to the newer games, and the remakes do exist. Looking back from Generation 5, it's absolutely amazing how far the Pokémon series has come. I bought a used copy of Final Fantasy Tactics Advance, and the clans were named this. Just imagine! If I was actually a bit younger and lived in the United States, this could have been a sensationalist news story! But it's only rated E! How dare people abuse the naming feature to name characters whatever they want! 